I think it's been interesting that, that, they, that alcoholism came up in the play quite a bit too. And I found that very interesting that regardless if it was the one percent, you know, the owner of the farm, you know, who was abusing uh, some kind of drug because of their, their life, the miserableness of their situation, or it was, you know, again, the pigs once they gained control. Regardless of which side it was on, there was still that reliance on something, a substance, uh, because obviously something was wrong with that cow, right? Um, I do want to give a chance, uh, a few of our actors have chosen to join us, which I think is great. We've got our, our donkey and our, and our workhorse here. Uh, Woo! <laughs> but, uh, you guys want to come in on, uh, you've been working with this play for months now. Any of the issues that you want to bring Yeah, it's something that, I mean, hasn't been mentioned yet, but uh, I mean, I look at the play often from Boxer's point of view because that's my character, so it's, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about that. And the idea that, um, I don't feel that he gives his loyalty easy. I mean, when the pigs first come to him with this, he's he's pretty stubborn in in what he's doing. But I feel like um, when a message gets thrown at him enough times, and they strike that fear in him of losing the things that he loves in life, that's when he is ready for change. And then once he's gotten under this new regime, he won't change anything because that message is constantly being spit at him and it's ingrained inside of him, and he doesn't want to change. Change is hard, and he wants things just to stay the same. And so I know for myself, like, I'm a teacher. I teach third grade. I've got two daughters at home, and I'm terrified of change because I can be relatively comfortable. But when I think about what else is out there, it makes me wonder, like, how can we not have change? Because we're just that workhorse being told whatever the media wants to tell us, and we hear it over and over again, and so we marry, and that's like just what we live. And so I think there is a need for change, and uh, I don't know, that's, that's what hits me in the play, that's what I, you know. So you don't want us all to be like boxers? <laughs> no, it's not so well, I think, I think it's, I think it's with Boxer too because yeah. you know it's like change is hard and it's scary to you know he's my master and he feeds me and sure things are shitty right now but I'm still taken care of you know and like I'm getting by and when Napoleon's there it's like yeah things may be awful but like he's right you know he's the one in control and I'm just here to do the work and it's easy to do that it's easy just to say I'm just gonna keep doing what they tell me to do as long as they don't bother me. And then one day it's gonna bother me and that's what I'm yeah. right. one day I'm on my knees and like I got to kill you for yeah. Yeah. You know in Orwell's book, for anyone who's not familiar with it, they uh, when they get boxer working on the windmill, he uh, overworks himself and collapses and yeah. as soon as he's so not they can't work him anymore on the farm, then uh, Napoleon wants to send him off to the glue factory to uh, to to, oh to, to make money on him. Yeah, yeah. In the book, they don't shoot him. They take him to shoot him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but I think that's a, a really big message too. The idea that like the workers are used and used and used, right. and when the workers can't benefit the leader anymore, they're disposed of to get a little bit of cash that they can take from. Literally expendable. Wow. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, that that really reminds me of just like police and military. Like the yeah. message ingrained in their head over and over, they're just told that they're they're comfortable, you know, like they're thinking maybe this situation sucks. There was a police officer in Boston who was crying when they were evicting people, and instantly they started berating the police officer, mm -hmm. um, saying like, "This is your job. This is what you're the supposed to do." The other cops were berating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, and just uh, thinking about like the way the military is used, you know, they're used until they're no good anymore, and then like our veterans are not taken care of in this country; they're just dumped mm -hmm. off. So I just see the the. Like what you were saying about the workhorse and the message there is being like certain um, professions or castes or what have you in our society. Yes, sir. Yeah, like um, just to, like watching like the whole play going on. Like like what I what I really get from it is like um, you know, like subliminal messages. Like it, it's so subliminal that it, it, it acts upon like on a day to day basis, like on on occupied movements all around the world. You know, it's like the infiltration of the minds and um, 
tell them, tell them how, how to tell people, how, how to make them complacent, you know, to tell them that this is what you need. Like, for example, Molly, you know, with the sugar cubes and uh, the ribbons. The ribbons. Tell her that I love that, this, by the way. That got you know, me every time. And then, um, what do you call it? One of the pigs having, like, his little worn to mind thinking about, you know, um, if, um, like the person that he co-leader with, that they how, how they turn against each other, but like so, like what I really got out the play is just like um, as human beings, it's not what we intended to be, you know. Like think about us like in a big farm, living, working hard every day, and still it's still not enough. It's still not enough, you know, regardless. Yeah, I think too that um, a lot of times we come to this movement of the occupation with the story we're drafting, so to speak. You know, the whole big proverb, he who tells the story rules the world. And even this message about working hard that you mentioned, I think many of us come to the movement really determined to work hard, but in a way that's almost cooperative with the powers that be, so we get kind of focused on reform. And the process, you know, that we're starting to articulate is that our engagement is about informing, reforming, and transforming. But how do you get to transform? You know, because it's an uneasy shift. And, um, you know, the philosopher Nietzsche said the deed transforms the doer. So the more we get active in being engaged with the kind of change we want to see, hopefully we become more empowered. Because, um, in the immortal words of ACDC, we're on a highway to hell. <laughs> and we need the best of who we are together in order to get on a new path and create that path, so. I just wanted to say that it's interesting that um, you guys are the ones who stuck around. I mean, we're the work That is hilarious. Are you drinking beer? The person who works no matter what, the person who does nothing no matter what, and that's kind of what we're all pulled into. <laughs> yes. And so it's a perfect you know, juxtaposition that everybody else is kind of like stuck in the middle and kind of just left it. I think the message is too about, <laughs> about vilifying people that were once seen as heroes um, when they're no longer in a position of power. Uh, what they, you know, and Boxer, of course, goes right along with it. But, you know, Snowball, he looked up to Snowball. Snowball was like the guy. And as soon as he gets removed, Napoleon sends a new message that hits him. And it's like, okay, he was bad. He must have been. You know, he had to be. And I think for a lot of it, from what I've been seeing, I mean, obviously I'm not down there in the Occupy movement with you, but from what I've been seeing on the news, they are vilifying different groups around the country. They bring the police in, they get them out, and you know, then they look for the, the sympathy for the police officers. And, and, and I have total respect for police officers. I think they get involved because they have good intentions in what they're doing. But I think the idea of the media being able to vilify any type of change to be able to keep things the way they are in the status quo. I think we got a comment over here. Um, I just called out everyone that's out there in the lobby drinking. I told them that they should better. There's only like occupiers in here who can start to get back in here. So they said they were going to be a couple minutes, so we're going to have more people in just like five minutes or so. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was, was there anything else you wanted to add? That was no, it. No. Okay. And over here. Something that really struck me was the debate that was going on with the windmill. Uh, and like uh, an identity crisis because like uh, I think it was Napoleon was saying like we don't want this technology that's like what we're against that's the way of man and that's like we don't want to become more like man and then uh, uh, Snowball was making the argument about like yeah but we need to continue on and we need to think about the future and sustainability how are we gonna take care of this farm if there aren't men to take care of it like how are we gonna take care of ourselves and I think that that's really at the root of, of all social change and, and what causes tension and, and discord and, you know, um, the process of, of trying to identify what it is you're about. What is it that you actually stand for? What is it that you stand against? Is using technology just continuing a capitalist system or is uh, finding alternatives a way to transform through capitalism? And all these other questions about like where we are now and where it is we want to go. If anybody's wondering, that the windmill really is in the book. That uh, he doesn't talk about alternative energy, of course. That wasn't an issue then. Uh, that was something our, our adapter brought brought into it. 
But uh, yeah, the windmill. Well, the windmill is supposed to be a metaphor for for uh, for the five-year plans and the debate between trusts.